Hello everybody, welcome back to Halloween Month. It's Advent Nebula. Now I'm Corella Cocaine and thank you for joining us for Pop Culture Therapy. <laughs> so this episode we're dedicating to one of our all-time favorite directors of horror who had a, like we said, a very influential stretch from the late 70s to the early 90s, Mr. David Cronenberg. And David Cronenberg is a Canadian director, and he specialized in technophiliac, technophobic, psych and body horror. And all of that basically means is that he really liked to put elements of technology or the good or bad of technology into his movies, along with the fear of what change is. Some of his movies that we'll be talking about really take that look at if you fear something, it is going to take over your lives in a negative way. Same thing if you're overly obsessed over something, it can also destroy your life. Yep. He looks at he looks at that cautionary tale of having a happy medium in what you do rather than being overly obsessed. Yeah. And basically the movie set this goes from is from 1975 with Shivers all the way to 1996 with Crash. Because after Crash he started going more in a different direction with his movies. Because um, with then he did Extend Spider... History of Violence and Eastern Promises, which are very different from the entire rest of his filmography. Absolutely. And most people have seen something done by Cronenberg, but may have not have known they've seen something by Cronenberg. And the reason I say that is because one movie that has really hit on both sides of the spectrum that people have tended to watch but don't know is The Fly. Yeah, it's his most well-known is the remake of The Fly with Jeff Goldblum. And so the original Fly, which was done in the 50s, um, had Vincent Price as one of the main characters, and it was kind of like a murder mystery with scientific exploration. And it was done in the manner of taking place in the 30s and 40s, where you were looking at what are the consequences of playing God. Very different yeah. than the Frankenstein story because that was trying to play God by creating man. This was trying to play God by trying to change the elements of people by going back and forth between time or trying to create those superpowers or things yeah. like and that. And the 1956 version of The Fly is very much a relic of its time because it is a very anti-communism film yes. at the same time. It is, it is definitely a very subversive film that makes you see different things because everybody is pointing fingers at everyone else. Where when Cronenberg did his remake of this movie, he did it about the cautions of technology and mm -hmm. doing it in a way that anything you do it you don't understand is going to have a consequence on yourself. And it all the one thing that he does here that he does in so many of the other movies, which I know your favorites are a part of this as well, is he also demonstrates the consequences of confidence and ego. Yeah, if you are an egotistical person in any of Cronenberg's movies from his, this time frame of his movies, you're more than likely an agent of self-destruction of yourself. Absolutely. And you really see this in The Fly because Jeff Goldblum's character, his name is Seth in the movie, he, he's a misanthrope. He is not good around people, but he's a genius. And when he gets into this mode of wanting to create, he puts all of his passion into it, damning the consequences, damning the 
control factor of checks and balances to the point where he destroys himself. Literally and figuratively destroys himself. And Gina Davis plays his wife who... His girlfriend. Girlfriend, yeah. Who's watching his transformation through this whole process. And the climax of the movie, you're going to have to have a stomach for it to be able to handle. You do. Because it is... It is definitely the perfect example of body horror. Um, and it's in this transformative way. Because when most people think of body horror, they think of Clive Barker's Hellraiser movies and things like that. Which, this is very different. Because it's one of the few films that you actually watch the literal progression of a person's body changing. And it's all practical effects. And you get to see the body change it with the, alongside the mental stability of it. Yeah. You're watching a man break down mentally and actually transform into this creature and become that creature itself and have the body motions and the mentality that the creature would have with the fly. And it's it's very frightening and it's and it's sometimes it can be really hard to watch. I know when um, we watched The Fly, myself and Kaiju, he watched the Cronenberg one first before watching the older one. And when he had first watched this one, because he, as much as he enjoys Cronenberg, he, Cronenberg has a very special way of doing things. He is very gritty and in your face. Yep. You, he does not pull punches because his form of horror is making you actually fear what you don't know because it's showing you what takes too far to go. Yeah, he wants you to experience what's going on as you're there. That's why he's always been very pro practical effects and also part of the reason why he stopped doing horror after Crash. Next one we'll go into is probably my personal favorite, Scanners, which was one of the debut films of Michael Ironside playing the villain Dr. Ravik. Scanners is about the technology overwhelming you with television, but at the same time, a stroke causes Cameron to get, uh, develop these psychokinetic powers where he can make people's brains explode. And he is not one of the and you actually have this underground society of telepaths. So you have this technology that is trying to subvert a naturally, well, in this universe, a naturally occurring skill of yep. being telepathic or having this If you're a psychokinesis, ability. they want you in the society underground uh, and not expose yourself to the world where Cameron just developing these powers is rebelling against the state. Because in his mind, because it really does play on that communism aspect as well, of feeling as though he is being controlled or he's being limited and he's not having the ability to do what he wants because he feels that Big Brother is controlling every aspect of his life to the point where he, when he goes insane, he goes insane. And Dr. Ravik, played by Michael Ironside, he's kind of the mouthpiece for the society underground for the public, trying to keep the exposure of the telepaths becoming common and known to the masses. And the climax of the film, I think everybody has seen because it is one of the most meme scenes in uh, cinema history. Oh, God. And it also shows the advent of what happens when corporatization takes over. It's, another, it's just like They Live. It has the same commentary mm -hmm. as They Live about society and capitalism in the 80s. And it actually holds up to this day because one of the main arguments in our modern era is how much does the government control what we do when we do it and how we do it and 
in this particular film, that's exactly what it is, is Cronenberg is saying to the point where it's still saying it to this day, that the world is run by these corporations, that it's all underground, and... The government has no say. The corporations and all their money are the real mm -hmm. people running the world. And it gets very scary, and I love Scanners. Scanners, the reason why I enjoyed Scanners is because it tells you straight out from the onset what type of movie it's going to be. Yeah. It doesn't hide anything from you. And uh, it, the opening scene alone tells you that you're going to be in for a bloody treat. And watching these people's heads explode, so to speak. You can't help but laugh, but also be horrified at the same time. Well, because once again, it is taking the element of body horror because you're watching people change right before your eyes. And then you're watching people get taken over, go crazy. And a lot of people say the one biggest flaw about this particular film, which I kind of don't agree with, but I can understand where people are coming from, is unlike The Fly or a few of the, his other movies, there is no good character. No, every person in this movie is a piece of shit. And you, you're not... You're not invested in anyone surviving because there is no good person and no bad person because everybody is responsible for their own health. And the whole movie is a shade of gray. Oh yeah. And you you have to be comfortable with the fact that for his particular horror, unlike where most horror has to have that final girl or that lone survivor, even if you have anybody surviving a Cronenberg film... They're fucked up. They are screwed beyond belief. There is no happy ending for anyone. The Brood is probably the best example oh, of this. God, The Brood. So The Brood is actually from the late 70s, actually 1979. And this is kind of one of those things where you have... It almost feels like when you watch it that you're like, is it going to be a vampire film? Is it going to be anything like that? But no, The Brood is basically looking at the personal connections to people. Yeah. And it's an allegory for the horrors of leaving yourself away from other people. Yeah. What happens when you isolate yourself to the point of not being connected to people. And this is one has one of Cronenberg's most famous scenes, the abortion scene that is probably one of the most disturbingly graphic scenes he's ever produced in a movie. And what really happens with this is you're trying to figure out what is right or wrong because you have this unyielding rage that every character has but you also have this idea of what does it mean to be a mother? Yeah. And what does it mean to be a family? Because the brood doesn't technically mean anything negative. Brood is another term for family. And you're trying to understand what it means to be a part of something else. Yeah. And when Cronenberg wrote this movie is when his wife got pregnant and his fear of fatherhood. And this is the allegory for that movie. But Cronenberg's storytelling gives you that nice little horror twist on just the fears of fatherhood. Well, exactly. Because Cronenberg actually credits this as being one of his most personal films to him because it is showing the power of being a part of a group and the power of not isolating yourself and that is i would say for any horror movie out there the most incredible thing that you can have because in horror it is very isolating 
And most horror movies are incredibly isolating because you do tend to have that final girl. Yeah. Because everybody's dying around you. What if everybody doesn't die? Yeah. What if you are just fighting to live? Yeah, it's the whole aspect of this movie and the character development is, oh, it will weigh on you. And you're going to be thinking about it after the ending. Because it has one of those endings that you don't see coming even as a Cronenberg fan when you're first time watching his filmography. The thing is with this film, it's one of those I would recommend watching when you've gotten more into Cronenberg. Because this is probably the most Cronenberg of all the Cronenberg films, but it's definitely his best work in my opinion. Yes, I would say his next best work for me would be Videodrome. Which comment on society and voyeurism. Well, it also comments on our dependency for, well, at that time, that giant box that everyone has in their living room. Yep. And I think it's a great allegory to the modern time as well because voyeurism does not mean just watching someone do something sexually. I understand that's what most people connotate voyeurism with, but voyeurism is actually, I think, more so focused now on watching people live their lives yeah. with reality television. It's pretty much what it is. And with Video Drone, it, it takes on the idea of voyeurism, but also the idea of what is needed to keep ratings alive. Which has not changed in our modern era of streaming either. And you always have, in this particular movie, reality versus illusion. And there are so many times in this movie, which confused the hell out of Kaiju when we first watched it. It's a movie that requires multiple viewings. It requires multiple viewings, and you never know... Even, it's not even something that gets resolved in the end. You never know sometimes what you're watching. Is it real? Or is it in his mind? Because James Woods does such a fantastic job of playing this terrible human being who is a sleazy, sleazy man who wants to get the next big ratings. Yeah, yeah and it's kind of fitting that James Woods after doing this movie, teamed up with David Lynch for one of Lynch's movies. And a lot of people actually think of this as the best of Cronenberg's movies, Second the Scanners, because of the fact that it looks at the seductiveness of technology. Because for James Wood's character, he has to have the best of everything. He has to be the person who has everything that's there everything right at the palm of his hand and he has to constantly fight to maintain control of reality because there is a time where he touches a television screen takes back the television screen with him and becomes a part of this horrific experience he's watching in tv and I personally think this was a great, I know this is probably not what the Wachowskis were thinking, but whenever I first, the first few times I watched The Matrix, I thought of this movie because of the fact that it plays around with the fact of what is real versus what's on the other side of it. And this is another one of those movies that... There is no happy ending. Yeah. Another one of his films, and this one's considered his biggest financial flop and has become a cult film in the years since its release, Naked Lunch. Oh, God. <laughs> if you want a movie that wants to steer you away from doing recreational drugs, but we know Cronenberg probably did a lot of them, oh, here's the God. film for you. Oh, where to begin with this one? So it actually takes on kind of like that satire yeah. mindset to it. And it is horrific. 
and Peter Weller coming off a of RoboCop into this film. And you're like, huh? And basically, it's a satire on, like, sniffing glue for the most part. But it's as an exterminator. And with him, he basically gets so freaked out about everything. And it takes on sexuality. It takes on drug addiction. And it takes on the aspect of what is right and what is wrong. And it's... It's a movie you have to be in a certain mindset to be able to watch this movie. Well, and that's the hard part when you have this. Is you you have to expect that it's going to be weird. This is probably the weirdest of his movies. And Videodrome was pretty weird of itself. But this one actually takes on the weirdness of bugs turning into typewriters mouths appearing on different parts of their body where it would normally not be of them trying to develop this family dynamic between peter weller and his wife in yeah. the movie and how they come together and try to conceive a child when your vagina looks like bug teeth and so it was very weird but it takes a lot of the delusional aspects of what Cronenberg does. And the reason why I've always appreciated Cronenberg when we have such great directors like Carpenter, Craven, and Cunningham, and so many others, is because with him, he doesn't, he doesn't develop boundaries. Not to say that Craven, Carpenter, or Cunningham do, but comparatively, yeah. he definitely sees a roadblock and says, I'm going to go five steps beyond it. Which, his last horror movie, which he did right after Naked Lunch, it's kind of more of a psychological thriller than a horror movie, but at the same time it is. And this is probably one of the movies James Spader is known for in his early career with Crash, where... He's an author, but he has a addiction where he gets turned on with his partner when they're in a car crash. This is probably one of the movies where the boundaries get pushed a little far. And it's a 1995 movie. I'd like with Naked Lunch, you got to be in a certain mindset as well to watch this one. But you can kind of see after this one. Cronenberg was kind of getting tired out of the horror movies that he was doing at the time. Well, he was. And I think the challenge with it, with any horror director is that there's only so far you can go before people really start expecting it. And because the first two movies that Cronenberg did in the late 60s and early 70s were much different than what he did once he got into his horror groove. Which pretty much starts with The Brood and ends with Crash. And then past that, he wanted to try something new, not to really go mainstream, but to feel like he was actually connecting with a larger yeah. audience. Yeah, it extends a history of violence. Uh, there are both two movies that, they're comic book adaptations, but they're... Oh, for existence, yeah. yeah. They're so different from his catalog. And he shows such dynamic skill. And I can appreciate why he wanted to do things differently. Because when you have been a director for so long, doing something that most people may feel that is kitsch or, wow, we've seen this so many times. It is hard. And I think it also has to be hard for directors. Because um, I can only imagine how a lot of other horror directors feel about this. When a lot of their movies are more cult classic than financial successes. Yeah, his first financial successful movie that wasn't a cult hit was Eastern Promises. Mm -hmm. Which that actually got some Oscar nominations. And because, like... 
one modern horror director that definitely has had the luxury of not just being solely defined as a horror director is James Wan. Yeah. Because he's been able to dabble in both. Because he's done some of the Fast and the Furious movies on top of doing his horror stuff. And also directed Aquaman. Yep. And so he's had the luxury, but not many horror directors, especially in the 80s and 90s, actually 70s, 80s, and and into 90s, were able to get out of that horror scope because horror is so pigeonholing. While it does extend into so many other genres, if you tend to do horror, that's what people expect of you. When I was watching a documentary on one of the Hammer films um, from the 60s, it was the same way there. That they're like, oh, you do horror? Well, we don't have anything that regard. And people were looked or passed over because of what they've done. In modern days, we don't have as much of an issue, but that had to be hard for Cronenberg, like it was so many other prominent horror directors, because they didn't get a chance to stretch their skin and do something that nobody else would have expected. Yeah, Cronenberg got his wish when he got tired of doing horror movies and has done some great great dramas now his upcoming film is a remake of crimes of the future which was his 1970 film which was a sci-fi time travel film which he's going to do a modern update on which will be very curious to see but i think it's fascinating to think for a man who's 72 years old that he's had an opportunity to have such a dynamic career and he in his storytelling for horror and non-horror he really does go on those human emotions and yes in his horror phase he does not make characters who you feel bad for or that you root to live with or you root to be alive at the end of the story he knows how to tell a story to make you think wow okay, this is not a journey yeah. I want to go down because these they're very great social commentaries without being in your face trying to send you a message. Now, the one last one we're going to talk about is he made one of the first truly successful Stephen King adaptations. Yes, which I love this movie. And, and it's what broke Christopher Walken out as a true movie star, too. Exactly, which was a rarity. And this is called The Dead Zone. It's from the mid-80s. And for this particular story, The Dead Zone is actually, Stephen King-wise, book-wise, is actually fairly short. Yeah, it's only the novel's only about 400 pages. Which I know most people like, 400 pages is long. No, when it's Stephen, Stephen King. King. <laughs> no. This, this is like a novella for Stephen King. I was going to say, when most of his books can on average be at least a thousand pages, this is a short book. And this story for Dead Zone also takes on that aspect of technology. Because this is a particular film where you have a screenplay that is focusing on what happens when you have political themes, when you have crime. The supernatural and the ability to resurrect from the dead. And add in the technical, technological aspect of people trying to come together to talk about everything. But it does play on the demonic, the psychic, the um, atmosphere of it all. And you have Martin Sheen who's in it. You have Tom Skerritt, Christopher Walken. It is so much in there. And basically it really is about how to prevent a crime. Because the, Z the, <clears throat> the dead zone is actually about trying to prevent something from happening and what's happening is you're 
Walken's character had a near-death experience, mm -hmm. and now he's able to communicate with people who have died, and they're forewarning him of other people that are going to die. And the most important thing that you're looking at is trying to protect the poli a politician from either not dying or trying to decide if it's justified. Because you have a Reagan era president, can presidential candidate that's played by Martin Sheen, that you're trying to you're trying to ask the question of what is justified, what is okay, what are the boundaries that people are able to take, and it has the propagandizing of it because everybody outside of walking with the Christ with the psychic power is trying to figure out why is there a problem yeah and when stephen king wrote this novel he wrote the novel when nixon was president to kind of give you an idea of the politics that are thrown into this book and so it's quite fascinating to to see the movie done because Stephen King has not had a lot of successes. And this was the first true successful Stephen King adaptation. Because mm -hmm. most Stephen King adaptations in the movies are terrible. His books are great, but nobody can create it on screen. Yeah, and Stephen King has said that Cronenberg's the only director that could actually capture his writing, but Cronenberg only ever wanted to adapt this one book. Well, and I think the reason why he only wanted to adapt this particular book is really because it fit his narrative of who he is as a director. Because if you go into too far outside of his spectrum of who he is as a director, you lose so much because it plays upon mind games, which is what Cronenberg does best. And so I would recommend if you have not seen a David Cronenberg movie. Dead Zone is probably your best starting point. Dead Zone is probably the easiest one to start with because it is not as far out as many of the others. But the Criterion um, Collection actually has done a number of his cult films, such as Brood, Scanners, and Videodrome. Crash is the next one that's going to be coming mm -hmm. out from Criterion. So if you want to see something more extreme by Cronenberg, definitely check them out. Same thing with The Fly, but start with Dead Zone. And if you're not a huge horror fan, that's the benefit about this particular director. He has so much in the modern telling. And even his first two films were not horror. So you can even go back and watch his very early filmography pre-Brood. So I would take advantage of it because he is definitely well worth it. And, and if you're not looking for horror, Eastern Promises. It's probably the movie I would recommend if you're looking for a dramatic film of mm -hmm. his. And so we are going to continue our Halloween month with a few other videos. Um, but we will get back to you on those because we have so many ideas to dig Dude. through. Well, we got two more to pick out. And we will come back with you later on with our last two podcasts for Halloween month. With that said, bye!